This is an example of a hypothesis test for population proportion. And this will be a two-tailed test. And we will be using the normal approximation. That means that the test statistic will follow the, the normal, standard normal distribution. And our critical values will come from the standard normal distribution. A Humane Society claims that 30% of U.S. households own a cat. In a random sample of 200 U.S. households, 72 say they own a cat. At alpha equal 0.05, is there enough evidence to reject the society's claim? So let me uh, summarize what's given. The sample size is 200. X, the number of successes, is 72. And um, our level of significance is 0.05. So we need to set up the null and the alternative and make sure that the conditions are met to use the normal approximation. The claim is that the proportion is 0.3 or 30%. So writing that as a statement in terms of the parameter p, that will be p is equal to 0.30. Okay, so this is the Humane Society's claim. Because it contains the case of equality, the claim is the null hypothesis. And that makes the alternative not equals. There's no sense of direction implied or inequality applied at all in this problem. So to um, test the conditions of whether or not we can use the Z distribution for this, we need to check if n times p and n times 1 minus p, some books call this q, are both at least 5. So n in this problem is 200. The um, hypothesized or claimed value is 0.3. And we want to know is that at least 5. Well, 30% of 200 is 60, and that's definitely at least 5. Checking the other product, if p is 0.3, then the complement to that will be 0.7. Is that at least 5? Well, 70% of 200 is um, 140. I blanked on that for a second. So check and check. So the conditions are met so that we could use um, a one proportion Z test, is what the TI-84 calls it. Our um, standardized test statistic will follow the Z distribution. And it's our sample proportion minus the hypothesized proportion over the square root of P times one minus P over N. So we need P hat the sample proportion. And that's equal to x over n, the number of successes out of our sample size. And that will be uh, 72 out of 200. Okay, converting that to a decimal. That's 0.36. All right, so I expect my uh, standardized test statistic to be positive because what we observe is greater than what is claimed over the square root of 0.3 times 0.7 over 200. So putting that in my calculator, that will um, be 0.06 divided by everything under that square root, 0.3 times 0.7 divided by 200. 0.1, sorry, 1.852, rounding to three decimal places. So to know whether or not this is large enough to reject the null hypothesis, I need to find the critical values. Because this is a two-tailed test, because I have the case of not equals in the alternative, 
I know this is going to be a two-tailed test. So using the critical value method, I need to find those two critical values. And to do that, I need to remember that I need to divide alpha, which is 0.05, by 2. Okay, so I have equal areas of rejection. All right, so the critical values using 0.05. So dividing that in half, I will have 0.025 amount of area in each tail. This is the same way that you find the critical values if you were testing a claim about a mean when sigma is known and uh, the population is normally distributed. So if you're taking my class, this part should actually be review. Anytime we're working with the normal, standard normal distribution after we cover um, how to read the tables and use the inverse normal is, is pretty much going to be review. So I have 0.025 amount of area in each tail. I could use my standard normal table and find as close as I can inside the body of the table and read outward to find that negative z-score. Or, because I'm using an area first, working backward to find a z-score, I'm going to use my inverse normal distribution. And my cumulative area to the left of that lower critical value is 0.025. If you have an older TI-84, the input it needs is a cumulative area. So you'd either put in 0.025 or 0.975 to find this upper critical value. Okay, so my negative critical value, this is a common one. When we're using alpha being 0.05 for two-tailed tests, the critical values are going to be plus or minus 1.96. And that one happens a lot. All right, so I need to decide where does my standardized test statistic lie with respect to these critical values. Since it's positive, is it further to the right of 1.96? No, it is in the fail to reject region. It's about here. Okay. So I know my decision is to fail to reject the null hypothesis. I'm failing to reject the null, and the null is the claim. So to answer the question, is there enough evidence to reject the society's claim? There is insufficient evidence to reject the society's claim that 30% of U.S. households own a cat. To get the p-value, the p-value is going to be double the area further to the right of the standardized test statistic. Because alpha was divided in half, this is going to be half of the p-value. So to get it in terms of alpha for comparison, I need to double this. So you could use your normal CDF function in the calculator. My lower bound is that standardized test statistic. My upper bound is a super large number. So this area is 0 0.032, okay, but that's not actually the p-value. I need to double that. So that p-value is 0 0.064. And my level of significance is 0.05. So when your p-value is greater than or equal to your level of significance, according to the current text I'm using, other textbooks um, put the case of equality with the less than or equal to case for rejection of the null. But ultimately, it's arbitrary. So when your p-value is greater than your level of significance, the decision is to fail to reject. If I changed my level of significance to 0 0.10, another common level, the p-value would then be less than that. 
and then my decision would be to reject the null. So it is possible to fail to reject at one p-value, I'm sorry, fail to reject at one level of significance and reject at another.